mind How'd you feel? Let's go Feet on the dashboard Can't really ask for more Love in the hatchback Sound in the A-track Feet on the dashboard Can't really ask for more Hand on the stick shift of a small auto repair shop in the tiny town of Hatchetfield, Lex Foster sits in the driver's seat of a parked 1986 Fox Body Mustang. He bobs her head along to some smooth tune that plays on the car's radio. That is, until the song cuts out and the tape deck rolls. And that is when I came into possession of the strange black book. What the hell? Lex tries to switch it back to the radio, but the knob seems busted. Tape continues. Within its pages, it's burial rites, spells, incantations. Lex whacks the stereo. The tape cuts in and out. To worship these lords in black. Mine! Pakotho, Bliklotep, Tanoi Karaxis. As Lex kicks the center council, her boyfriend, Ethan Green, leans in through the open car window. Hey, don't hit it like that. Nibble an Ephim and Wigog your wrath. Ethan swiftly thumps the radio once, just so. The tape stops and the smooth tune flows from the speakers once more. That's Pleased with himself, Ethan wipes his oily hands on his oily coveralls and returns to his work under the car's hood. If you were going to rebuild this junk heap, why didn't you just give it a new stereo? Because Mr. Houston don't want no new stereo. He wants the car just how it was before the crash. That includes that janky ass tape deck. This is Mr. Houston's car? Mark? Yeah. And with all that money this guy sunk into tracking down these old parts, he could have bought a new Mustang. His wife had in this car. I don't know why you want to keep something like that. He'd be happier in a Mazda. Maybe he doesn't want to be happy. Maybe he doesn't want to forget her. Well, if it were me, this thing would be in the dump. When shit happens, you move on. Beating yourself up won't bring anyone back. You hear one minute gone in it. That's why you gotta be careful. All right, give her some gas. As Ethan leans on the front of the Mustang, looking down at the engine, Lex presses her foot on the gas pedal, only to find the car somehow shifted into drive. The Fox body jerks forward, pushing Ethan back. It's sl he slams into the workbench and watches like a deer in headlights as the car comes closing in. No! No! Just, just before Ethan is crushed, Lex slams on the brake. Screech! The Mustang stops an inch from Ethan's face. It sits there, engine purring, as he leaps to his feet and pulls open the driver's door. Out! Out! I, I'm so sorry, Ethan. I, I swear it was in park. Lex climbs out of the car and Ethan points to the letters by the gear shift lever. Look at this, Lex. You looking? This is a P. This is a D. You see the difference? You see how the P has a little tail coming down? That's how you know it's not a D. He sees Lex is visibly upset. He softens. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to yell. I'm just... I could have died. I swear it was in park. She buries her face into his chest and looks back at the Fox Bunny Mustang. The engine growls. Ethan rubs her back. It's okay, baby. Come on. You're shaking. You're shaking. 
Across town at Pizza Pete's Family Fun Zone, Tom Houston's knee nervously bounces under the table. You're shaking, Dad. What are you talking about? Tom sits in a booth across from his 10-year-old son, Tim. Around them, birthday parties rage and pinball machines clatter. Tom is anxious, and Tim can tell. You want to switch sides so you don't have to look at the Bid Kid games? Hey, I'm not shaking, all right? Tom glances behind Tim at a row of violent arcade games, including one called Roadkill. He watches two pixelated cars plow into each other. He winces, remembering Crash Bang. You know what? Yeah, let's switch sides, huh? They switch. From this new side of the booth, Tom's got a clear view of the entrance. He watches it like a hawk. Tim, I just want you to like my friend. You mean your girlfriend? No. She's a girl. But we're old friends. But you are intimate. Intimate? Do you know what that means? It's what Uncle Paul says. Yeah, well, Uncle Paul's a geek who needs to keep his mouth shut. All right, she's here. Through the front doors, Becky Barnes appears. She scans the restaurant, spots Tom, and waves. Hi! That's Becky Barnes? Yeah. What? Nothing. I'm just proud of you, Dad. Becky makes her way to the booth, throwing her jacket next to Tom and pecking his cheek. <sighs> I'm so sorry I'm late. Bridget had her operation today, and the parking here is just bananas. <laughs> Hi, Tim. I can't tell you how excited I am. I'm at Pizza Pete's with two Houston boys. I'm the luckiest lady in the whole town. With Becky in the booth, the obnoxious teenage waiter rushes to Tim. Oh, hey little man, you ready to order now that your mom's here? She's not my mom. My dad's just intimate with her. Tom freezes, blushes. Tim grabs Becky's arm. Do you want to play zombie house? Uh, sure. It, it's not scary, is it? <laughs> the ten-year-old pulls Becky out of the booth, over to the big kid games, leaving Tom to order. Yeah, can we just get a large cheesy pea and a pitcher of coke, please? Whoa, whoa, okay, okay, slow down, sir. Large, cheesy pea and a pitcher of what? Coke. <sighs> Tom turns to see Tim and Becky standing at Tim's favorite machine, orange toy guns in their hands. On the screen, a horde of zombies bite and claw. <laughs> Quick, shoot him! Shoot him? What if I want to help him? <laughs> Come on, you're gonna die! <laughs> a smirk creeps into the corner of Tom's mouth. Tim hasn't had this much fun at Peace of Peace since... <laughs> Crash! Bang! Becky's video game character is ripped apart by a wave of the undead. Oh, they got me! <laughs> Not very good, am I? Just continue. Okay, but I'm really gonna need your help. Later that night, Tim is asleep on the couch between Becky and Tom as some terrible movie plays on the TV. You listen to me, Chris Kringle. No one says no to Jacqueline Frost. Ah, oh, great. Here comes another song. I've got a cold heart and I don't like Christmas at Becky motions to Tim's head resting on her shoulder. Looks like the movie put Tim to sleep. Yeah, I don't blame him. It's awful. I'll take him upstairs. Tom tucks Tim into his bed, kisses his forehead, and starts for the door. He stops when Tim props himself up, half awake. Is Becky still here? Yeah. But, uh, she's right about to go home. She doesn't have to. 
Get some sleep, bud. Back in the living room, Tom finds Becky curled up on the couch, trying to make sense of the movie. Okay, Jacqueline is Jack Frost's teenage daughter, but Chris is just regular Santa in disguise. Wouldn't it be better if Chris was Santa's teenage son? Then it wouldn't be so weird when he starts dating Noelle. I know she's 18, but uh, still, I don't like it. Yeah, yeah, but but then it would be son of Santa goes to high school, and that's, you know, that's like a totally different movie, Bat. <sighs> You're right. So you want to call it a night? We could. Or I could stay. If you stay, you'll be here when Tim wakes up, and he'll start thinking of you in a certain way. I don't know if, uh, I don't want to put that on you if you're not ready. Tom, I was with my ex-husband for 15 and miserable years. If that time with him taught me anything, it's that I don't want to waste one more second being unhappy. I want to be here when Tim wakes up. Every time he wakes up. The question is, do you want me here? She touches his face searches his eyes. To you, Tom? Do you want me here? Becky Barnes, I want you right here. Oh, Tom. <laughs> they embrace. Between passionate kisses, Becky asks, Should we turn off the movie? Nuh-uh. Let it play. Tom and Becky fall onto the couch and make love to the sounds of Santa Claus's going to high school. All is right with the world. A few days later, in the early morning, Tom stands in Tony Green's body shop, looking down at his fully restored 1986 Fox Body Mustang. There she is, just like new. Well, as new as a 33-year-old car can be. Hey, Tom. You all right? Huh? Yeah. I'm sorry. She's just so beautiful. I'm sorry she took up so much space in your garage for, what, a year and a half. Has it been that long? Tom's eyes glaze over as he turns back to the car. The car he had since high school where he last saw Jane. Listen, Tom. A buddy of mine is a collector of vintage automobiles. He'd give you a good price if you don't want to... Take care. No, no, no. She belongs with me. That car meant a lot to Jane, and, uh... Hey. Hey, pals. It's all right. I can't imagine losing someone like that. If anything happened to my boy, Ethan, I don't know what I'd do. Look, why don't you come inside and, uh... Thanks, Tony. I'll see you around. Tom climbs into the car and revs the engine. Now, Tom. He waves as Tom speeds off. Not long after, Tom sits behind the wheel with Tim in the passenger seat. The town outside blurs by as they roar through the streets, en route to drop Tim off at school. Tom glances over to find his son staring blankly out the window. Last time Tim rode in this car, things did not end well. You okay? Yeah. We got the car back. 1986 Fox Body Mustang. She's a classic. You know, in a few years, if you're really good, this could be your car. What do you think of that? I don't know. Tim goes back to steering blankly as they pull up to Hatcherfield Elementary. All right. Well, have a good day at school, huh? I'll pick you up at four. I think I'll just take the bus. Okay. Tim hops out and heads for the entrance. Tom's about to leave when... Beep. The car horn honks itself. Tim runs back, grabbing a paper sack from the back seat. 
<laughs> Forgot my lunch. Thanks, Dad. Tim's off again, leaving Tom to scratch his head. Did he see Tim's lunch and honk the horn? Guess he must have. Tom stops at a red light as a corny old pop tune comes on the radio. He smiles. Ah, Jane loved this song. I, on the other hand... Tom turns the dial to the classic rock station. That's more like it. The light turns green, just as the stereo switches itself back to Jane's pop song. Huh. It's funny. The garage door clanks open, and Tom pulls the Mustang into its old parking spot. He turns off the engine and sits there for a moment. He runs his fingers down the side of the steering wheel fondly. I missed you. He turns to the passenger seat, this time not talking to the car. I miss you. He chokes down the lump in his throat and starts into the house. As he shuts the garage door and turns out the light, he hears... I miss you too. He whirls around, but there's no one there. Just the clutter and the cobwebs and the car. The next day, Tom tears through the selection at a local bookshop. Worried he might be hearing things, he's just looking for a few basic answers. He's flipping through pages when he's interrupted by a bright, smiling face. Hey, stranger. Fancy meeting you here. Ah, hey, Beck. I was just picking up some books for the kids at the hospital. Ours are getting a little ratty. <laughs> What you reading? No, nothing, nothing, uh, it's nothing. Neurology for dummies? You're not a dummy, Tom. Yeah, I know, I've just been doing a little bit of research. I'm wondering uh, how exactly, um, flashbacks work, you know? If a familiar place or a thing or a, a car could trigger auditory hallucinations. I mean, Shane's a psychiatrist. I could ask, ask her. I, I mean, I, I, I wish, I wish I could ask her. <laughs> You're thinking about Jane? Is this because of the other night? No, no, it's uh, just a passing thought. Book is really hard to understand. It's certainly not for dummies. All right. Um. Well, I don't know what your plans are tonight, but you and Tim are up for it. I was thinking about coming over after work. We could get some takeout, play a few board games. Uh, uh, tonight's no good, Beck. I, I just got the Mustang back. So. He points to the car parked outside the front window. Oh, I remember the Mustang. It's the same one from high school, right? I love that back seat again. Becky. There are people around. <laughs> oh, sorry. Was I being crude? Yeah, a little. Anyway, we got two cars now, so I, I gotta clean out the garage so that they both fit. Oh, I can help. Nah, nah, you know, there's a bunch of shit in there, Becky. You don't want to go through all that shit. Okay. Well, maybe we can do something this weekend? Absolutely. Tom pulls back into the garage. He sits behind the wheel, thinking. He cooks dinner for Tim, helps him with his homework. He lies awake in bed for hours. He remembers Becky's face. Pizza Pete's, Tim's laugh, that night. Jane. He can't go on like this. He gets out of bed, looks in the mirror. Tom, Tom, what are you doing? Doing? What the hell are you doing? He goes through the house, collecting Jane's things. Old pictures, keepsakes, a bottle opener from the birdhouse. He puts it all into boxes and carries them into the garage. He pulls out his phone and takes a deep breath. 
He dials an old friend. It goes to voicemail. Hey, uh, Tony. Hey, it's Tom Houston. I was uh, just thinking about what you said. Just curious how much your buddy would pay for the Mustang. Yeah, give me a call back whenever you like. Tom hangs up, sighs, and starts inside until... I thought you missed me, Tom. Hello? Who's there? Have you gotten my voice already? How many thousands of times did I whisper your name? Tom? He realizes where the voice is coming from. The Mustang. And he knows whose voice it is. Jane? But you're dead! The car's headlights flash. The horn honks. Wrong. I'm not dead, Tom. I'm a car. Surprise! I was trying to be subtle, to give you your space. I know you startle easily, but come on, really, Tom? Sell the Mustang? Is, is nothing sacred to you? This can't be happening. Look, I, I know you're shocked. So am I. I. I honestly can't even believe that you would consider selling the car in which I was driven to the hospital to give birth to our son. Uh, I wasn't going to sell the car. I was just curious what the guy was willing to pay. Oh, okay. So, there's a price tag on all of those memories? On our life together? On me? You're just going to box me up and stick me in the garage with all the other shit? I've been gone for what? A, a year and a, a half? And look at how much shit has built up in here. How is this possible? How are you... How are you a car? Really? You're seriously asking me that question? You don't pay attention to anything, do you? No wonder we crashed. <laughs> Think, Tom. What were we listening to? I'm, I, the radio? I remember the tapes. Okay. We had just left your parents' house. Tim was asleep in the back seat. I put on a tape. The audio diary of one of my patients. He was a professor of literature. Years ago, he had discovered some sort of spell book, and he claimed that it was the cause for his complete mental breakdown. And, and, and I was reviewing his old notes, and he recorded himself reading some sort of incantation from this book, part of a ritual of soul transference. And, well, I guess the ritual worked. Because when the car hit us... Your soul? transferred into the Mustang? Yes, Tom. For better or for worse, I'm a car now. I'm not happy about it. It's been a, a very lonely and painful existence. All I've wanted is to get fixed and come home. And that girl called me a junk heap, and I want a new stereo. Yeah, 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 yeah. whatever you want, Janie. Whatever you need. You're home. I thought I lost you. But you're home. Oh, this is a miracle, baby. I gotta go tell Tim. No, no, don't you dare. What? Why not? Think about it, Tom. First, Tim is told I'm dead, and now you want to tell him I'm a car? Him for life? Oh, so I can't tell Tim his mom's alive? You can't tell anyone! Can you imagine what people would say if they found out I was a car? Oh, look at the sentient car. They would put me on display in some sort of traveling auto show, and I have uh, no interest in that. Thank you very much. Hold on, so I'm supposed to keep this a secret for my whole life? Calm down, Tom. I have a plan. But, I'm going to need your help. 
Here. Get inside me. Let's go for a drive. The sun comes up over Hatchetfield, and the town goes about its daily business. Tom and Jane drive downtown, where people weave in and out of coffee shops, clothing stores, and offices. All right, Tom. Shh. Take it slow up here. Onto Main Street. Slow down. Let's just cruise. Huh? Look at all these people. Coming and going. Look at these women. You see him, Tom? Yeah. Do you find any of them attractive? Uh, no. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let, let's try the beach. That afternoon, Tom and Jane are parked by the beach near Starry Cove, watching people sunbathe and play volleyball. One woman catches Jane's attention. Okay, there. See her in the, in the pink bikini? What do you think of her, huh? Ah, uh, I don't... I don't know. I... Come on, Tom. This isn't rocket science. You know, is she... your, your type? No. I... Well, why not? Because she's not you! Oh, bullshit. Okay. Look, okay, sorry, sorry. I, I know you were trying to be sweet, but I'm, I'm not going to get upset with you. I, I just want to know which of these women you could see yourself sleeping with. Hey, Janie, I can't do this. I'm at the beach, sitting in my car, looking at all these women. I feel like... Like a creep. Well, do you want to go to the mall and look at women there? I want to go home. Oh. All right. I'll make this easy for you. Okay. Look at the one with the clipboard asking for donations. Tom surveys the boardwalk and spots the woman Jane's referring to. You mean that Greenpeace girl? Yes. I'll start. I find her very attractive. I like her hair. I like that she cares about the environment. I bet she is a vegetarian. I like her. I'm feeling her whole earthy vibe. Huh? So? What do you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, she's pretty. Is that what you want from me? So, we're in agreement, huh? Yes. Okay. Is, is there anyone else you prefer over her? No. Not really. Okay. Okay! Good! <laughs> okay, so what's your point here? Shh. Look. Tom looks back to the Greenpeace girl. After being ignored by passers-by for hours, she throws up her arms. Oh. Oh. She's giving up. Oh. No charity here. Oh. She's heading down the block, probably to the farmer's market. She's smart too. I like that. All right, Tom, follow her. I... Oh, okay. The engine purrs as Tom follows the Greenpeace girl into an empty street between the beach and Oakley Park. No, shh, hang back a little, Tom. Oh, oh, she looked back at us. Oh, uh, yeah, don't worry, sweetie. <laughs> Nothing to see here. I'm just a car rolling along, going where I need to go. Ah, I'm not following you. No, there's a million reasons I could be driving this slow. Maybe I'm, I'm looking for a place to park or a sp specific address. <laughs> All right, Tom, no one's looking. Speed up, close the distance. No one step on it. Tom gives it some gas. The engine growls. The Greenpeace girl turns back. Her eyes go wide, and she starts to flee the approaching Mustang. Shit. She sees us. Quick. Tom, now! Now what? Run her over! What? Hit her, Tom! She's running! Hit her, quick! Before she gets away! No! Tom swerves to the side, narrowly missing the Greenpeace girl. He slams on the brakes so as she runs for dear life. She rounds a corner. Gone. Damn it, Tom. I hope you're happy. It took us all 
day to settle on her. Why, Janie? Why did you want me to hit her? How else am I supposed to get a new body? What? Think about it, Tom. Last time the spell was read, my soul went into the car. And I've queued up to the tape to the transfer ritual. And since my body is gone, I need to put my soul into a new body. What? You thought we were just scoping out chicks for fun? Jane, you're talking about killing somebody! No, no, no! I, I just want to give the body and the spirit a shock. You know, just loosen the bond a little bit so my soul can slide in and push hers out. Well, I, I don't want your soul in some body of a random woman I don't even know! But that's weird! I'm sorry, okay. I'm sorry, Tom. I, I completely forgot to consider your feelings in all of this. You're right. I'll just, I'll just stay a car forever. I'll drink gasoline and go in every six months to let some strange men change my oil. All right, all right, all right, all right. If this is what it takes to bring you back, I'll do it. I mean, I have to. But can, can it be someone who deserves it? What about Linda Monroe? What? Do you find her attractive? You know what? No, let's sleep on it. It's late. I'll drive us home. The sun goes down as they pull into the garage. Tom turns off the engine and they sit in silence. After a moment, Jane says, I've been thinking about it and you know where we could have looked for a body? Where? St. Damien's. You know, the hospital? Why? Because isn't that where your old friend works? You know, Becky Barnes. Becky Barnes. Ah, uh, I haven't seen her since, uh... Yesterday? In the bookstore? Huh? How did you... And you two looked really friendly. Oh, well, she's an old friend. An old girlfriend. Come on. You know I'm not the jealous type, but I've had a lot of time to think while I was being repaired. And I know you loved her a long time ago, but is there any part of you, any small part, that was glad I was gone so you could be with her? Janie, no. I, I, I'm just, I'm just hurt. And I'm scared. And I'm a car. Hey, hey, hey. You may be a car, but you're still my wife. Now what can I do? Well, you've known it was me for a whole day. And you haven't even kissed me. Oh. I'm sorry, Janie. Make me feel like a woman again, Tom. Kiss me. Um, where? Tom complies. He starts kissing the car, everywhere he can think to. The dashboard, the door handles, the steering wheel. Is that good? Uh, yes. Tom, take your shirt off. Okay. He feels her smooth upholstery, her soft seat cushions. He's tender and attentive. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Make love to me, Tom. Make love to your car. Knock, knock. There's a tapping at the car door. Tom quickly covers himself and rolls down the steam-covered window to find Tim. Oh, hey, kiddo. What are you doing in there, Dad? Oh, nothing. Why are the windows all foggy? Are they? I heard you get home and you didn't come in. Are you okay, Dad? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like a million bucks. I really do. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the two of us have um, been through a lot together. Been through a rough patch recently, but um, I think things are finally starting to turn around. Don't you think so, pal? 
I guess. Tell you what. Why don't we do something fun this weekend, huh? We'll go to a drive-in movie? Hmm? As a family? How does that sound? Just the three of us? I'd like that. I like Miss Becky. The car's rearview mirror cracks. Tom gulps. His son just spilled the beans. Uh, uh. No one could ever replace Mom, but Becky's really nice. I like when she stays over. She makes really good pancakes. Why don't you, um, head on in, son? Uh, oh, okay, Dad. You coming too? Yeah, uh, I hope so. We'll see. <laughs> okay. Tim heads inside. Tom struggles to think of how he's going to get out of this one. Hey, Jane. Jane, let me explain why uh, Tim is confused. When I, when I said the three of us... Just shut I up! The three of, uh, shut up. I want the truth out of you, Tom. What the hell is going on between you and Becky Barnes? Now? I'm, ever since I found out your car... I mean, it's over with her! What's over? Nothing! I'm not stupid, Tom! I'm a car! And I understand that you thought I was dead. I get that. Given time, I can learn to forgive you in your, and your infidelity. But it's gonna take a lot of work on my end. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Jane. So I'm gonna need you to do some work as well. And I don't want to hear any whining. Next time I tell you to run a woman over. Are we clear? Crystal. Okay. Put on your seatbelt. Why? Where are we going? To Becky's house. You're gonna end this nothing that's been going on behind my back seat. The moon hangs in the night sky. A cool mist covers the ground. The Mustang's headlights cut through the fog, illuminating the home of Becky Barnes. Tom parks the car. The engine rumbles. All right. Here we are. Go ahead. Tom reaches to pull the keys from the ignition. No. Keep me running. I don't want to get cold. But, uh... I, I mean, this shouldn't take too long, right? It was nothing, after all. Right. Tom knocks on the front door, and Becky answers, a smile spreading across her face. Well, this is a surprise. Hey, Beck, can we, uh, talk inside? Sure. She sees the Mustang running nearby. You know your lights are on, right? Yeah, uh... My... Let's talk inside. Becky leads Tom toward the kitchen. I was just making dinner. You're more than welcome. Hey, hey, hey! Come over here. Away from the window. She'll see you. He pulls her into the corner of the room. Confused, she tries to look for someone outside. Who? Becky. How do I put this? Do you see my car out there? Yeah? Don't look! My wife, um, Jane, is in my car. Oh my god, Tom! You dug up your dead wife? No! What do you think, I'm crazy? <sighs> my wife's soul was transferred into a 1986 Fox Body Mustang by some kind of evil magic. Tom, you're scaring me. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'm glad you understand the severity of the situation. I'm scared too. She's not acting like herself. I just spent all day driving around looking at women, trying to find one to run over. Tears well up in Becky's eyes. She nods, humoring him. Mm-hmm. Yep, I didn't do it. But I might have to. She wants a body. Sooner or later, I'm gonna run somebody over. That's why you have to stay away from me, Becky. Stay far away. As of now, 
I've had to drive Jane everywhere, but I'm afraid that she's going to be able to drive herself. Cars don't drive themselves, Tom. I know, I know, I know, but Jane... She's tricky sometimes. She just lets me do things that she could probably do better herself. Thinks it helps my self-esteem. Just drives me crazy. Oh, Tom. Becky, Becky, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to put you through this. I love you. I always have, and I always will. But I'm married to that car out there. <laughs> and I gotta go. Tom heads for the door. Becky tries to stop him. Tom, I don't think you should be driving anywhere. I think you need some help. Let me call my friend at the hospital. Goodbye, Becky. He leaves, slamming the door behind him. Back in the car, Tom exhales. There. It's done. Good job, Tom. Thank you. Ah. Uh. Now let's, uh, let's go home. He tries to shift into reverse, but the lever won't budge. The engine growls. Jane. Jane, what are you doing? That's not the only reason we came here, Tom. You see, I understand you loved me and her. You're a man, torn between two women, and that's torture. I'm going to end that pain, Tom. For both of us. Beep, beep. The horn honks on its own accord, drawing Becky out from inside the house. She looks toward the Mustang and starts for it. Tom? Tom, please don't go anywhere. <laughs> See? You don't have to choose. You can have us both. My soul in her Shady! Don't do this! Mm, the engine roars, the tape deck switches on. From the car speakers, the audio diary of Jane's former patient starts to blare. I will now read from the ritual of soul transference. I always wondered what I'd look like as a redhead. Mohanda de Dedalia! Jane! No! Mm. The Mustang takes off, barreling in the direction of Becky Barnes. She sees the car headed straight for her. Tom! Becky breaks for the house. Realizing she's too far to make it, she turns and runs for the nearby woods instead. The car swerves, kicking up dust as it gives pace. Jane! Stop it! Stop it! Tom struggles with the steering wheel, but no matter ah. how hard he tries, the Mustang keeps course, careening towards Becky. Somebody! Help me! The car goes off-road, following her into the forest. In desperation, Becky considers climbing a tree, but no, not after what happened last time. She keeps running. Behind her, the car bangs and bounces, thundering over rocks and underbrush. Inside, the tape continues. The day, the day, the day, the The car closes in. Becky rolls around as it speeds toward her. Becky! Thunk! The Mustang plows into Becky. She tumbles over it, slamming on the hood, then the roof, then the dirt, as the car continues flying forward, directly into a tree. Crash! Bang! Darkness. Silence. Then, a voice. Miss Barnes. Miss Barnes, can you hear me? Becky's eyes flutter open. She's in a white room, on a clean bed, looking up at a police officer. Beside her, a heart monitor beeps. She's banged and stitched, but all right. Tom, where's Tom? There's been an accident, miss. Miss Barnes, you're in the hospital. Mr. Houston has been taken into custody. What? Why? We were on the lookout for the owner of a red 1986 Mustang. He tried to run down Omen at the beach this afternoon. Don't you remember him chasing you with his car? Yes, I remember. Well, 
I'm afraid Tom Houston has suffered a complete mental breakdown. He believes his dead wife's soul was in that car. Is it true that you and he have recently formed a romantic relationship? Yes. Miss Barnes, who can say what triggers something like this? Guilt? Grief? Maybe the guy just didn't want to be happy. Good night, ma'am. The officer turns to leave. Becky sits up. Officer, what happened to the car? Pile of junk went straight to the dump. Good. Later, Becky is released from the hospital. She breathes in the cool night air, feels the breeze on her skin, and heads for home. Tim is awoken from a restless sleep by the sound of his bedroom door creaking open. He rubs his eyes and calls through the dark. Dad? Shh, sweetie. Dad went away for a while, but don't worry. The light on Tim's nightstand switches on. Becky sits on the edge of the bed and Jane smiles. Mommy's home. Foster's room burst open, and her mother, Pamela, comes storming in. Nanners, you got any idea what time it is? Hannah stops strumming and looks up from her ukulele. 
Nightmare time. It's 3 a.m. I got a date bright and early with my future husband, so shut up. Pamela rips the instrument from Hannah's hands. No! Bad girls don't get to keep their little guitars. Pamela hobbles for the doorway on a broken foot, her heavy cast dragging beneath her. Hannah stops her, pleading. Please, I have to keep singing or I'll forget the songs. Good. Pamela slams the door behind her. Defenseless and alone, Hannah lays back on her beat-up old mattress, pulls the blanket over her head, and waits for the nightmares to come. The next morning, Pamela plants herself in front of the TV as her favorite show begins. This is Morning Cup of News with Dan and Donna. <laughs> Hello again, Dan. You miss me? <laughs> I'm gonna marry you one of these days, you beautiful bastard. Just wait until you get a load of me. Hey, Nanners! Bring them beers in from the icebox, huh? Hannah stands in the kitchen nook of her mother's rundown mobile home, exhausted from another restless night. She grabs a half-drank six-pack from the fridge. On the TV, Dan Reynolds flashes that winning smile. Good morning, Hatchetfield. This is Dan Reynolds. And I'm Donna Daggett. As leaves fall and the jack-o'-lanterns light up, we know around these parts I can only mean one thing. Just a few short months until the Hatchetfield Honey Festival. <laughs> That's amazing, Donna. <laughs> You're amazing, Dan. <laughs> Hey, hey, Nanners, you, I want to be alone with my man. Go, go play outside. With what? I don't know. Go find some dog turds or something. Here, knock yourself out. She tosses Hannah a beer from the six pack. Hannah inspects it, shrugs, and heads outside. Pamela turns back to the TV, melts into the recliner. All right. Where are we going today, Dan? Outside, Hannah sits on the metal steps to her front door. She stares out into the Hatchetfield Witchwood, the forest that's bordered her home all her life. Lately, however, something has changed. Almost as if the Witchwood itself has woken up, and it's calling to her. She cracks open the beer and takes a swig. Ugh. Hannah looks up to a tree. She nods to it awkwardly, like a wallflower at a school dance. So, what's your name? That's pretty. Huh? Can't hold who? Hannah leans closer to the tree, trying to hear what it's saying but its voice is drowned out by vroom. Hannah looks to find an old station wagon pulling up beside her trailer. From it emerges Douglas Keene, AKA Duke, the social worker assigned to assist the foster family. He sees the girl talking to a tree. Hannah? Hiya, Duke. Hey, darling. Just came to check. What you got there? He points to the can in Hannah's hand. Knowing she could get in trouble, she decides to play dumb and shrugs. <sighs> Where did you get that? Mama. She inside? No. Did she tell you to say that? Uh-huh. <sighs> Let's go have a word with her. Inside, Pamela is also playing dumb. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Keene. I cannot believe Hannah would just steal one of my beers. I taught you better than that, young lady. If you're gonna drink someone's beers, you gotta throw them a few bucks, huh? Uh, just seems to be a pattern here. Miss Foster, the first Lex gets caught with your pills, and now Hannah with your alcohol. I know, Duke. They gotta make it so hard to be a single mother, huh? If only I had a man around to help me. To hold me. 
Uh, all right, Pamela. Look, <clears throat> you're not gonna be holding on to Hannah at all if this keeps up. You wanna lose her? Like you lost Lex? Don't get my hopes up, Duke. This is not a joke, Pamela. I found Hannah talking to a tree. She needs to be mentally engaged with something. Where is your ukulele? What? The instrument you took from her. Me? Take from that old child? Yeah, that's what she says. Well, we have already established that she is a lying little turd, so... Pamela retrieves the ukulele from the cupboard. I was just cleaning it for her. Here you go, Nanners. You little tattletale. Hannah sees the instrument. A look of concern washes over her when she realizes... That's not mine. Yes, it is. It's wrong. No, it ain't. Just give Hannah her ukulele back. You think I got money for two of these? This thing keeps me up all night. She won't stop just playing. How am I supposed to get my beauty sleep? <gasps> Don't play past nine, Hannah. With the instrument returned, Duke heads for the door. He stopped when Hannah explains. It's the wrong color. Mine's white. What? In her hands, Hannah holds a black ukulele. Duke turns to her mother, but Pamela shrugs. She couldn't care less what color the thing is. Duke turns back to Hannah as her eyes go wide. It's only black in my dreams. In nightmare time. Is this nightmare time too? Elsewhere in Hatchetfield, an aerobics VHS tape from the 1980s plays on a vintage television set. On screen, the coach instructs. All right, girls, pick up those knees. <laughs> That's it. An old corded wall phone rings. A mysterious woman stops her workout, pauses the tape, and throws a towel over her shoulders. Miss Holloway picks up the receiver and puts it to her ear. Hiya, Duke. Hey, darling. I see you've taken your first tenuous steps into the 21st century. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> well, you knew it was me. Finally caved in and got yourself a caller ID, Miss Retro. <laughs> <laughs> That's some fancy detective work. So, um, you busy tonight? Douglas Keene, are you asking me out? It's a school night. Yeah, and I gotta wash my hair, but um, this isn't about us. There's a 14-year-old girl named Hannah Foster. Uh, I think she might be in need of your expertise. Later, two cars pull up to the Foster residence. The old station wagon and a 1987 Pontiac Firebird. Duke's hand raps on the front door, and Pamela answers. Hello again, Pamela. This is Miss Holloway. Miss Holloway smiles politely, turning up the collar on her baggy jean jacket. Uh, she's the specialist I told you about. What did I say? Hannah don't need no specialist. I'm a good mother. I have never taken my daughter to a doctor, so... Unless you got a court order, I'm not letting this shrinky dink into my home to poke around Hannah's head. Duke sighs, raises his brows, and turns to Miss Holloway. You're up. Miss Holloway leans closer to the screen door that stands between her and Pamela. She places a hand on the doorframe and starts tapping as she speaks, rhythmically, hypnotically. Miss Foster, Pamela was it? You don't know me. No, I don't. But I do know you haven't been sleeping very well. Neither is Hannah. Her voice is melodic. It echoes in Pamela's ears. Up at all hours of the night. Heck, must be a battle just to keep your eyes open right now. You want to sleep, don't you, Pamela? Huh? With Hannah sleeping well, you can rest too. 
deeply, peacefully. Isn't that what you want? Uh huh. Why don't you just let us in so I can help Hannah? Okay. As if in a trance, Pamela opens the screen door, letting Duke and Miss Holloway inside. Now go sleep on the couch. Uh-huh. Pamela sleepwalks to a sunken old sofa and flops face first into the cushions. She's already snoring. Duke watches in awe. He can't explain the things Miss Holloway can do, so he won't even try. He just shakes his head and smiles. I think I'm in love with you. You know that? Mm. Wouldn't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> Later, Hannah sits on her dilapidated mattress, hugging her knees. Miss Holloway is on the floor beside her. She takes in the tiny room, the room Hannah once shared with her older sister. Electric lights hang from the ceiling. There's a map of California pin pinned to the wall. Miss Holloway smiles at the young girl. Hello, Hannah. I'm Miss Holloway. I'm a friend of Duke's. I work with children. I help them with problems that adults might not understand or believe. She sees the black ukulele propped in the corner. She picks it up and addresses it fondly. <laughs> so Duke tells me that your sister gave you this. I used to play music too. A long time ago. It's not mine. She switched them. Your mother? No. Miss Holloway sets the instrument down. Hannah, can you tell me about Nightmare Time? When did it start? When Webby went away. At the sound of the name, Miss Holloway freezes. Hannah, is Webby a spider? Sometimes. Sometimes she's a girl. She used to sing to me. I have to play her songs every night or I'll forget them. I'll forget Webby. She wants to get rid of Webby. Then she can get me. Who? The witch. What witch? The witch in the web. Outside, Duke hands Miss Holloway a cup of coffee. They lean on the remnants of an old wooden fence and breathe the crisp autumn air. As the sun softly sets, Duke explains. Alex and her boyfriend got picked up selling her mother's painkillers. Ethan got two years. Lex got five. That wasn't her first offense. And that was three months ago. Three months. I bet that's when Webby went away. What? When the nightmare started. Oh, Hannah and her sister, they were close. Lex was more of a mother to her than that charming woman. In fact, Lex told me that it was her mother's idea to sell the pills. Lex later denied it in court. I think she was afraid of leaving Hannah with no one. So maybe it's some kind of trauma that's keeping the kid up at night. Duke, I don't think this is like the others. I think Hannah might be in some very bad trouble. Well, can you help her? I'm gonna try. That night, Miss Holloway strikes a match and lights a large candle. The flame illuminates Hannah's darkened room. So Hannah, you say there's a witch in nightmare time. She's the one that wants to get you? Uh-huh. Well, if you can promise to keep a secret, I'll tell you something. I'm a witch too. A good witch? 
Most of the time. <laughs> Tell me, Hannah. In nightmare time, have you ever seen this? From inside her bag, Miss Holloway retrieves a small something, wrapped in a tattered shawl. Hannah recoils as the layers of fabric are peeled back to reveal a book. Bound in black, Hannah has seen this in her dreams, and she knows to fear it. Why do you have that? It's okay. I keep it safe. It's called the Black Book. It's bad. Do you know who the lords in black are, Hannah? They're Webby's brothers. They have followers. I think one of them is in your mind. But we're gonna get her out. Miss Holloway begins to open the black book. Hannah winces. No! There's nothing good in there! Hannah, sometimes things aren't black and white. Sometimes we have to use something bad to do something good. It all has a price. I know. I can pay it. Let's just say I have very good credit. Hannah, you have to go into nightmare time. No. But don't worry. I'm going with you. As the candle burns, a sweet mist fills the room. The electric lights twinkle. Hannah lays back on, in her bed and closes her eyes. Miss Holloway flips through the thick old pages of the black book, settling on one displaying the spell she needs. She takes a deep breath and taps softly on the book's cover as she guides Hannah. Relax. Focus on the sound of my voice. Drift down. Deep down. Good. Very good. Now, fast asleep, Hannah stands in an endless black void. Still dreaming, her eyes open when she feels someone take her hand gently. It's Miss Holloway, smiling at her. See? I told you I'd be with you. Now, I know nightmare time can be scary. But you have to remember, Hannah, this is your mind. No matter what anyone here tries to tell you, you are in control. Do you understand? Uh-huh. All the power here comes from you. And you are very powerful, Hannah. Okay? Okay. Now, where's the witch? That way. Hannah points. They're suddenly at the edge of a vast forest, but not one of trees. Instead, hundreds upon hundreds of people jut up from the ground, roots extending from their legs into the earth like twisted wooden veins. A heavy fog seeps in. Hannah and Miss Holloway set off into the mist, toward the witch. As they pass the statuesque figures in this human forest, some of them turn to Hannah, trying to warn her. Stay away, Hannah. We can't hold her anymore. Who are they? Tree people. The men with Hatchins put them here. They all had a touch of the gift. Some of them didn't want to be planted, but the hatchet men did it anyway. Their roots made a web. The witch was stuck, but now she's not. Stay out, Hannah. She'll get you. Hannah, don't stop. They press on, deeper into this strange wood. Soon, Miss Holloway begins to notice the attire of the tree people they're passing has become dated. 
They reach one girl dressed in an oversized vintage tee, bearing the logo of some 80s pop star the whole world's forgotten. This girl, her clothes are old. They get older the deeper you are. Casey was planted in 1986. The tree girl, Casey, turns to Miss Holloway in a ghost-like daze. Can I have your autograph? We have to go back further. Much further. Hannah and Miss Holloway pass people dressed in clothes from the 70s, 60s, 50s. The decades roll by until they find individuals who look like they're from the 1800s. Hannah stops. This is as far as I've come. I don't know their names. They're so old they forget how to tell me. We're near the center. The witch is close. Then let's keep going. Miss Holloway holds Hannah's hand tightly as they step beyond an invisible threshold. Into a place in Hannah's mind that's dangerous, unknown territory. Their feet fall through the fog and crunch unseen leaves. Before them, in the distance, is a ramshackle, rotting hut. The witch's hut. Smoke billows from, the, from a crooked chimney. All around the tree people spring to violent life, pointing and screeching. Uh, <laughs> freezes, resisting Miss Holloway's pull. I... I can't do this! Yes. Yes, you can. Don't let go. The tree people's jaws unhinge and their mouths open to an unnatural size. Their insides glow as they let loose an ear-piercing cat-like wail. Wind howls. Miss Holloway's grip on Hannah starts to give. Don't lose me, Hannah. Hannah! Miss Holloway! <laughs> Miss Holloway! Hannah's hand slips from Miss Holloway's fingers. She's pushed to the ground by a gust of cold air. She tumbles through briars and thickets of dry brush till she lands with a thump on the floorboards of an old wooden courthouse. You! Hannah looks up to find a village worth of angry townsfolk leering over her. The citizens of Hatfield, circa 1824. Two men grab her arms and yank her her feet. No! Let me go! She's back to the bench of a decrepit old judge. He points to her with a spindly spotted finger. Willabella Muckwab, you vile creature. You who hath danced with demons. You who hath penned the abominable tome with the blood of our children. You have been found guilty of the crime of witchcraft. For it, you shall hang from the neck until you are dead. No! Please! The villagers pounce on Hannah. She's suddenly in a clearing, the heart of what will one day become the Witchwood Forest. She's staring at a rickety platform. A noose hangs down from a beam up above. The townsfolk take hold of her and push Hannah toward the gala. <laughs> Kill the witch! Kill her! Kill her! Hannah's thrown onto the scaffold. In the back of the crowd gathered to watch the execution, one woman stands out. Hannah can make out her jean jacket and beat up sneaks. It's Miss Holloway calling to her. Hannah! Hannah! An executioner pulls a rope around Hannah's neck as the judge cries out. Never shall she plague this land again! This land we paid for with blood. Her immortal soul shall rot here, and the roots of the wood we plant shall ensnare her. Furthermore, caught and paid for with our sacrifice. Miss Holloway desperately claws her way through the mob. Hannah, you have to take control. You're giving them the power. With it, they can kill you. 
but the illusion is too strong. The witch in the web has Hannah caught in the memory of her own death. The executioner takes hold of the lever, ready to release the trap door beneath Hannah's feet. The innocent must suffer! She's put you in her place! The guilty must be punished! You are not the witch! You must taste blood to be a man! At the judge's signal, the executioner pulls. The floor beneath Hannah falls away. <laughs> Miss Holloway hurls herself at Hannah, catching the girl midair. The two of them go crashing through the confines of Hannah's mind. Neon lights flash, bulbs burst. Then, quiet. Miss Holloway and Hannah land on a dusty, dirty carpet in a large, dark room. They sit, brushing themselves off. Are you all right? I got scared. Well, don't next time. <laughs> Hannah, I know you're afraid of the witch. She shows you things. Terrible things. She wants to trick you. She wants to hide and, and make a big, loud noise. Why do you think that is? Because she's afraid of you. She's dead. You're alive. You're much more powerful than she is. She knows that. She wants that power. Don't give it to her. Remember that when we go back. I don't want to go back. We have to. It's not safe here. Where are we? I had to get you out of there, Hannah. I did the only thing I could. I put you in my mind. This is my nightmare time. Hannah looks around. She and Miss Holloway stand in the aisle of a crumbling, abandoned theater. The Starlight Theater. From the shadows, a writhing, withered husk slithers into view. Be careful. Miss Holloway touches Hannah's shoulder, cautioning her not to get too close. This thing is a mass of flesh three emaciated forms welded together, dragging themselves along with, a, with six bony arms. Three hungry mouths cry out eternally. What are they? Three girls I couldn't save. Girls like me? No, Hannah. Nothing like you. Miss Holloway points down the aisle toward the empty stage. Beyond it is a door with a neon exit sign glowing above. Look, there's the exit. We need you to go through it to get back to your mind. Hold my hand. There are bad things here. Penna takes Miss Holloway's hand and follows her down the oddly long aisle. Around them is decay and debris and moonlight shining through holes in the roof. The rows of ripped up velvet seats seem to stretch off into nothing. From the nothing, Hannah can hear voices calling to her. Hannah. Hannah. Over here, my little star. A chicken banana. Banana split, banana pudding. There's a thousand ways to eat a banana. <laughs> Hannah tightens her grip on Miss Holloway's arm. This is your nightmare time. Why are they calling to me? Because I don't listen to them. Hannah tries to ignore the voices as well, until she hears one that stops her dead in her tracks and makes her blood run cold. We just keep running into each other, don't we, Hannah? She whirls around. Suddenly, Miss Holloway is gone and Hannah stands alone in the center of the barren stage. Miss Holloway! Miss Holloway! It's then that Hannah realizes she's not alone. 
Carved into the stage beneath her is a strange symbol. Beside it, pinned to the floor by a black blade, is a rotting skeleton. Hannah backs away, only to find she can't cross the boundary of the etching below. It begins to glow around her. Green light streams up through the floorboards of the stage. It hits the skeleton, and the dead thing begins to wriggle and twist. It reaches an ossified arm up to its ribcage and wrenches the black blade free from its resting place. The heap of bones rises to its feet. Life returns to the corpse in a flash of neon green. What now stands before Hannah is a man with greasy black hair, a gnarled smile, and an all-denim wardrobe. How you doing there, Hannah? Who are you? How do I know you? Oh, don't you worry about that. Hungry? From behind his back, the man produces a sour green apple. He tosses it to Hannah. It reaches her. When it reaches her, it's rotten, crawling with maggots. She drops it in horror. Splat. <gasps> Ew! She looks up, and the man is now inches away. He grabs her arm. You're one slippery <laughs> little banana peel, you know that. But I got you now. It's a shame. So much power in that noggin going right to waste. In his other hand, he holds the black blade. He raises it high above Hannah's head. Let's crack it open and see what's inside. Oh. He brings the blade down, but Hannah is gone. He whirls around to find her safely cr clutching the arm of Miss Holloway. <laughs> you can't hurt her. You're dead. Am I? Am I, though? <laughs> well, I should know. I killed you. Oh, only about half the time. The other half, I mopped the floor with that head of yours. I ate your heart. And I took your jacket. Fits me better anyway. He pops the collar on Miss Holloway's jean jacket, which has now jumped to his body, completing his ensemble. What are you talking about? Well, ask the kid, she knows. You thought you stopped it, but it shattered when she came. Didn't it, Hannah? She sees it all. Every possibility. That's why her mind is so vast. So powerful. That kid <laughs> is a battery. No, she's a nuclear power plant. <laughs> she brought me back with nothing more than a little tooth. <laughs> You're a nightmare. That's all. Now with her around, oh, that one's a live wire. Woo! Two hundred years, the ghost of that old witch couldn't do much more than spook a few trick-or-treaters on Halloween. Now, she is a very busy woman, setting up shop in Hannah's mind. Pretty soon, Hannah's body will be her new permanent residence. Now well, that sounds like fun. Slipping into someone else's skin. Maybe I should give it a try. Back in the waking world, Pamela Foster's eyes burst open. Like a puppet on a string, she's lifted from the old sunken sofa and silently bobs into the trailer's kitchen nook. Duke sits watch outside Hannah's room, but he fails to notice Pamela sneaking up behind him. Wham! She knocks him out cold with an iron frying pan. In Miss Holloway's nightmare theater, the denim-clad man advances on her and Hannah. Think about it. A real wish. <laughs> no offense, Miss Holloway. The first disciple of Wagag Yurath, the author of the Black Book itself, paired with the most powerful psychic mind in the history of reality. Well, that's a match made in... Well, I don't want to say heaven. Hannah, we're out of time. You gotta get to the exit. They're not gonna let me go with you. Go now, Hannah, go! <laughs> Miss Holloway points Hannah in the direction of the backstage door with the exit sign up above. The girl runs for it, leaving Miss Holloway to square off with her old enemy. Well, well. 
together again. You and me. The old Dookaroo. It's a grudge match. <laughs> Uncle Wiley's back for another round and a shot at the belt. <laughs> back off. I got a knife. You mean this knife? In her hand, she now holds the black blade. <laughs> That's the one. Miss Holloway tightens her grip on the blade's tilt, ready to defend herself. But the denim-clad man makes no move. You come back just to talk? <laughs> Miss Holloway, you know me. You think I'm gonna fight you head on? On your turf? I don't want to get my ass kicked in front of these gorgeous girls! Hey, ladies! The six-armed, three-mouthed lump of undead tissue crawls onto the stage like an enormous screaming insect. Miss Holloway stays focused on her opponent. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm gonna cheat. Hey, you got a frog in your throat? Suddenly, Miss Holloway can't breathe. Back in Hannah's room, Pamela Foster looms over the sleeping Miss Holloway, strangling her neck. In the nightmare theater, Miss Holloway chokes and struggles in vain, gasping for air. She drops the black blade and falls to her knees. The denim-clad man pounces. In an instant, his hands are wrapped around Miss Holloway's throat, too. Just as Hannah is about to reach the exit, she turns back. Miss Holloway! The man looks to the three-mouthed monster. What are you waiting for? Go get her! The thing lunges forward and bolts for Hannah. Why? <laughs> it reaches her, Hannah closes her eyes and screams. No! From the girl, a pulse of psychic energy explodes. The six-armed thing is tossed into the darkness like it's nothing. The mental shockwave blazes forward, splintering the stage floor, cracking the entire theater in two. The man in denim sees the blast headed his way. Huh? Boom! He's thrown from Miss Holloway. In the waking world, the psychic eruption flings Pamela across Hannah's room. Smack! She cracks a mirror that hangs on the wall. Discharged from her own nightmare by Hannah's immense power, Miss Holloway wakes to find Pamela out cold on the floor. Duke stumbles into the room, holding a nasty bump on his aching head. Uh, are you all right? Miss Holloway nods. Uh, what about Hannah? It's up to her now. Either she's going to wake up, or the witch will. How will we know? Well, the witch kills us. That'll be a big hint. Unable to get back to Hannah's mind, Miss Holloway kneels next to the sleeping girl and holds her hand. Hannah finds herself lying in bed. Sunlight pours in through the tiny window. Her eyes flutter open. It's morning. Her room is clean and tidy and somehow brighter than it's ever been. She looks around. There's no sign of Miss Holloway or Duke or even her mother. She sits up, unsure what to think. Then the door opens and a smiling face peeks in. Hi, Hannah. Lexi! Hannah's sister, Lex, steps into the room with outstretched arms. Hannah runs to her. They embrace. I'm back! They let me go! They took mom instead! It's over, Hannah, okay? Now we can stay here together forever. Forever. Lex swings her backpack from her shoulder. The pins on the front sparkle in the sunshine. Look at all this stuff I brought you! <laughs> Lex unzips the bag and pulls out a veritable treasure trove of wonderful things, piling them all around, filling the room. Toys? Games? <laughs> What's this? A puppy! I'm gonna call you a Lex hands a happy little dog to Hannah. He looks her face and wags his tail. She giggles, sets him down, and looks around. Where's my... Didn't you give me something else? What? This isn't enough for you? I used to play it. 
It helped me remember... a friend. What was her name? You want some friends? Well, check out these guys! I got a whole set! Um, Lex removes five dolls from her bag. One with a mask-like face, leaking blue goo. A purple one, with a huge eye. A yellow one, with a head like a goat. Mm -hmm. A pink one, with a mouth for a face. And <laughs> a green one with fur and tentacles. Mm. Hannah sees them and knows who they are. Those are her brothers. They're bad. Who told you that? That nasty little spider you think is your friend? Uh-huh. Well, we've already established she's a lying little turd. Outside, the sunlight fades. Lex leans over the dolls, coveting them, worshipping them. The world is theirs, Hannah! All the worlds are theirs! But right here, these can be ours. All you gotta do is agree to stay here, okay? Deep down in Drowsy Town. Hannah backs away as Lex's voice begins to shift and crack. I'm not a monster, like they all said! You're my own blood, Hannah! The daughter of my daughter's daughter and of my daughter's daughter! <laughs> Not Lexi! It's you! <sighs> this thing that's not Lex lurches forward. Her back bulges up into a spiny hunch that scrapes the ceiling. The electric lights above the bed pop one by one. Dark muck drips down the walls as they crack and crumble. The knot Lex grabs its face and pulls. Its skin mask peels away, revealing haggard gray features and a toothless, joyless grin. Hannah stands, trapped in nightmare time, face to face with Willabella Muckwab, the witch in the web. I gave you the choice. You could have had your sister. Now you will have nothing. <laughs> the witch inches closer, dripping and stinking. All around, Hannah's room slowly chips away, leaving the stone walls of the witch's hut. The hag reaches out an enormous clawed hand and strokes Hannah's cheek. <laughs> Your bones will be mine. Your blood will be mine. Air. Hannah turns from the, gro the grotesque rotting woman, and something on the crooked mantle catches her eye. It glimmers in the firelight. Hannah's ukulele, polished and pristine, almost glowing. For an instant, Hannah's fear is forgotten when she remembers what the instrument means to her. Her love for her sister, her connection to a friend whose name she can almost remember. Seeing it makes Hannah feel powerful. Then she realizes, in nightmare time, a world of dreams and symbols, the ukulele is her power. That's... that's why you took it! Hannah pushes past the witch and runs for the fireplace. <laughs> the witch lunges after her. Her spiny hunched back scrapes the stone wall, spent sending a spray of sparks through the hut. Her talons lash. Hannah dives for the mantle. You took it from me! And you hid it in nightmare time! But it's mine, not yours. I have the power! She grabs the ukulele and lifts it high above her head. She radiates psychic energy. I have the power! Witch pounces but can't stop Hannah from swinging the ukulele with all her might. It hits the stone wall and smash. The witch's hut explodes into a million pieces. Boulders, bricks, and debris fly off in every direction. 
Willabella howls as her stronghold in Hannah's mind crumbles away, falling off into nothingness. Soon, all that's left is Hannah, the witch, and a woman with long white hair. Webby! With Hannah's power fully restored, so too is her connection to Webby. The cosmic being smiles at Hannah, then turns to the witch. Hello, Willabella. You've been hanging around my brothers. My lord! My king! Your king! Bitch! Close your eyes, Hannah. Hannah covers her eyes. Webby bends down over the witch, who cowers in fear. You were going to hurt my friend. I'm going to destroy you now. A ghost, no more. Just be gone. Webby puts a finger to the witch's forehead, and it starts to flake away. <laughs> The witch screams as she crumbles to dust. After 200 years, Willabella Mukwab is gone for good. Satisfied, Webby walks to Hannah and lightly touches her shoulder. Wake up, Hannah. Hannah's eyes blink open. She's back in her room. Her real room. Duke and Miss Holloway look at they look to her. Hannah? I found her. Webby's back. Nightmare time is over. Duke sets Pamela back on the sofa. She's still out for the count. What about her? I have a hunch Pamela's going to wake up feeling very guilty. She's going to confess something that's been weighing on her conscience. She might go away for a while. But I'll tell you what, Hannah. What if, somehow, Lex came home? Really? Ethan, too? <laughs> I'll see what I can do. Outside, the sun is rising. With her work here done, Miss Holloway heads for her 1987 Pontiac Firebird. Before she goes, she turns back to Hannah. You know, I help a lot of kids, and I always give them something when I go. A reminder of the warriors they become. Here. From her bag, she produces a navy blue Hatchetfield Nighthawks baseball cap. She offers it to Hannah. It's imbued with the power of Grayskull. As long as it's on your head, Nothing can harm you. Hannah takes the hat, pulls it on, and spins it backwards. Miss Holloway smiles, winks, and waves to Duke. She gets into her car and revs the engine. Duke puts a hand on Hannah's shoulder, and the two watch Miss Holloway drive off through the witch world. Your eye is 
for you. 